Sabbath to each one of us here today. We have a wonderful privilege to gather together in the house of God to study His Word and to worship together. We were singing in the song here this morning about our need to tell Jesus. There is a burning desire amongst Christians to separate themselves from the world. But there are two kinds of Christians that we're going to study about this morning. There is the kind that realizes the need that's mentioned here in this song. That's the need for Christ in their life as a guide, as a counselor, as someone who helps them out of troubles and trials. There is another kind of Christian as well, which we're going to study about this morning. And that's the kind of Christian who has the same desires, the same ultimate goals as the first group, but they want to get there on their own. And as we study scripture, we find that the group of individuals who are faithful, they're exemplified in Revelation chapter 14, verse 12. It's a very important verse in Adventism, Revelation 14, 12. When they organized the Adventist church, it was on this verse that they signed their names. It says there that here is the patience of the saints. So we can then understand that in this verse, we're going to find out what it means to be a saint. It says, here is the patience of the saints. Here are they that keep the commandments of God and have the faith of Jesus. A true Christian, a saint, is somebody who desires this same thing. I want to have these characteristics. I want to be able to keep the commandments of God and I want to have the faith of Christ in me. The psalmist, he had the same desire. In Psalms chapter 38, verse 9, the psalmist says, All of my desire is before thee. He said that everything else in his life was not important. The only important thing for the psalmist was to reach this characteristic, to be one of the children of God. He said, All of my desire is before thee. All of my desire needs to be before Christ as well. All of the desire of each one of us here today needs to be before Christ. So in order to do that, we have to find some example in Scripture. The Apostle Peter, he wrote in 1 Peter chapter 2 and verse 2 that we're like little children. Of course, we don't like to say that we're like little children until we get older and then we want to be younger. But while we're, you know, when you're my age, you don't want to say that that you want to be a child because you finally grew up. I, I finally got to the point in life where I have a discount in my insurance because I'm over 25 and I can rent a car and I can do all these things. I don't want to go back to being a child. And yet the Apostle Peter, he says in 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 2, he says that we're supposed to be as newborn babes desiring the sincere milk of the word that we might grow with this in our lives. So today what we're going to do is we're going to take an example from Scripture. And we're going to see what happens to the development of these two groups in a prophecy in Scripture. We find this prophecy in Revelation chapter 2 from verses 1 up until the verse that we read in the beginning, chapter 7. It's the prophecy to the church of Ephesus. The Apostle John on the island of Patmos received a number of messages for the churches. And these messages were important for the church in his time, but they're also written for us to have an example to know what it is that we can do in order to reach that goal which we mentioned in the beginning. Let's read together the entire prophecy and then analyze the two groups that are there. In Revelation chapter 2, starting at verse 1, it says, And unto the angel of the church of Ephesus write, These things saith he that holdeth the seven stars in his right hand, who walketh in the midst of the seven golden candlesticks. I know thy works, and thy labor, and thy patience, and how thou canst not bear them which are evil. And thou hast tried them which say they are apostles, and are not, and hast found them liars, and hast borne, and hast patience, and for my name's sake hast labored, and hast not fainted. Nevertheless, I have somewhat against thee, because thou hast left, thy first love. Remember therefore from whence thou art fallen and repent and do the first works or else I will come unto thee quickly and will remove thy candlestick out of his place except 
thou repent. But this thou hast, that thou hatest the deeds of the Nicolaitans, which I also hate. He that hath an ear, let him hear what the Spirit saith unto the churches. To him that overcometh will I give to eat of the tree of life, which is in the midst of the paradise of God. The city of Ephesus doesn't exist anymore today. It used to exist a couple miles from the Aegean Sea, opposite from Greece on the, what we today call Turkey. Right on the mouth of the Caister River, there was this city of Ephesus. And the word Ephesus means desirable. That's what the word itself means. And it really, truly was a desirable city until it was destroyed in a war. That particular city was considered to be one of the jewels of Asia Minor. It was very rich, much richer than many of the cities around it who were also very rich. And this great city that was there was also an important city for the early church. And it's a symbol of that time period of the early church that we find. That early church was desirable. It was founded by Apostle Paul himself, the church of Ephesus. And John, the writer of the Revelation, was a bishop of that church. He had responsibility to take care of it. So we can see two of the great early Christians were part of the formation of this church in Ephesus. It truly was a desirable church. There were seven things that made the church of Ephesus desirable, but there were three things which destroyed that church. Even though it had these seven desirable things, it was destroyed because it had three undesirable characteristics. So this morning, let's contrast the seven good characteristics with the three characteristics that caused this church to be destroyed. As I mentioned, that city doesn't exist today. You can go and visit it. There's a heap of ruins and rubble, and you can see that it really was a great city at one point. You can even see some of the ruins of the great temple of Diana that was there that's mentioned in Scripture. Even though this great city was so rich, it fell. And part of the reason is these three things that caused that church in that city to be destroyed. We want to make sure as we study this to apply these lessons to our lives. As we grow as Christians, we want those seven things that made them desirable, that made them Ephesus. And at the same time, we want to overcome those three things that caused that church to have such great trouble. And if we do that, then the promise is what we're going to finish off with this morning by understanding the promise that's found in verse 7, to eat of the tree of life. What are the seven desirable things that were there? Well, let's list them off. First of all, the early church, the church of Ephesus, was founded by Christ himself. He was part of that church. He was the basis of that church. So when we talk about the church of Ephesus, the first and most desirable thing was that Christ was the foundation of that church himself. He was there. The second thing is that they had the apostles who were there. The apostles themselves had been educated by Christ himself, and they could go into new parts of the world, expanding, bringing the gospel, and they had that gospel directly from Christ himself. The apostles were part of that church. That's the second desirable thing that was there. The third is that their doctrine was pure. They didn't have a chance yet to get all kinds of ideas. They didn't have so much free time on their hands. They were so busy doing the gospel work that the gospel which Christ had given them was the gospel that they went out and preached. Of course, we'll find out later on that there was a couple changes that were made here and that caused their downfall. But in this time, they were desirable because they had that pure doctrine which they'd received from Christ himself. The fourth thing that made them desirable was that they received the early rain on the day of Pentecost. They had received a special promise from Christ that when he left, he would send them the comforter. And in the upper room on the day of Pentecost, they received the early rain. And it gave them power to be able to go and spread the gospel. This was one of the things that made them desirable. The fifth thing is that they performed miracles. That went away later on. But they performed miracles. They healed the sick. They healed the blind and the lame and the deaf. And they went about doing miracles that were there. The sixth thing that made this church desirable was that it was worldwide. As soon as they received the message, what was the first thing that they did? They went and they shared it with somebody else. 
after some time this changed. Right? Well, sure, I've got the message and I'm very happy at home with the message all by myself. And they forgot later on that there was a whole world that needed to be reached. But in this time, in the time of Ephesus, they were desirable because they understood that they have to spread the message in all the world. And they went as far as they could. We find that within less than 70 years, the message had reached as far as India, as far as England. You know, England was a really far place from Palestine at the time. You had to walk to get there. So it was a, a different time. And yet they had that burning desire. I have to share this message with somebody else. This made them desirable. And the last thing that made them desirable is that they were united. They were one. They didn't quarrel amongst each other. They were really united together one with another. These are the seven things that made the church of Ephesus desirable. Inspiration in the Acts of the Apostles, it tells us that at the first experience of the church of Ephesus, it was marked with childlike simplicity. They were simple. Their church was simple. There was not a lot of forms. Not a lot of ceremonies that they had to go into. They had a very simple religion for what was there. All they desired was to obey the Word of God, to have Christ in their lives, to keep the commandments that He'd given to them. They were rejoicing because they were doing the will of God. This was important for them. They were filled with love for Christ as they went from one place to the next place, and they were united in their sentiment. So they were members of one body. They understood the words that are found in Ephesians chapter 1. You can turn with me. At the end of Ephesians chapter 1, the apostle is writing about this group of individuals. And he says in chapter 1, verse 22 and 23, he says that all things have been put under his feet, under the feet of Christ, and gave him to be the head over all things to the church, which is his body, the fullness of him that filleth all in all. These early believers, they were zealous with Christ because they understood that they were part of a body, the body of Christ. They were not individual believers. They weren't, I'm a believer on my own, he's a believer on his own, he's a believer. No, they were together, united as one body of Christ. In every city where they went, a church ended up being formed. There could not be a place where a Christian went that in a very short time he had spread the gospel to so many others that he formed a church right there. And that, these were things that made that church so desirable. And even with all these things, you must imagine and ask yourself, well, how come that church isn't around today? If they had all these seven wonderful things, why is it that that church isn't around today? So now we come to the part of the study that everybody's waiting for. Nobody waits for the good stuff in a study. Everybody assumes all the good stuff. We know all the good stuff. Let's get to the interesting stuff. That's the bad stuff. What happened to this church? What ruined this church? Inspiration tells us that there were three things. In Testimonies for the Church, Volume 8, on page 241, it's speaking about all these churches, and it has one sentence there that, for me, explains clearly what are the three things that destroyed this church. And you follow along with me. In 8T241, it says that they became more strict in regard to outward ceremonies, more particular about the theory of the faith, more severe in their criticism. So there are three things we have to talk about then. First of all, it says that they began to be more strict in regard to outward ceremony. That's the first point. The second one is that they began to discuss unimportant points of doctrine. And the third point was that they forgot to love each other. <coughs> These are three things that I want to talk about in some detail this morning. Because each one of us, we have a tendency to fall into the same trap that led to their destruction in our own lives as individuals and also as a church. 
we can follow down this road. And if we do what they did, then our candlestick will be removed just as theirs was, because we cease to be true Christians. So first of all, let's talk about this outward ceremony. Are ceremonies important? Sure, ceremonies are very important. They're part of what makes us, as Christians, is we have <coughs> ceremonies that we perform. For example, I have worship every morning. You have worship every morning, at night before you go to sleep. We have worship here at the office. Every day when we open the office here, we have worship at 8.30 in the morning. These are important parts of our Christian experience. They had ceremonies as well during their time. But something began to happen with their ceremonies. In Isaiah chapter 29 and verse 13, we're given there a warning that we have to be careful of as we go through our own worship services that we have. Even the service, we meet every Sabbath at 9.30 for Sabbath school. We meet at 11 o'clock for divine service. All of these are very important things. But something began to happen in this church. And in Isaiah 29 and verse 13, we find there a warning. It says, Wherefore the Lord said, For as much as this people draw near me with their mouth, and with their lips do honor me, but have removed their heart far from me. And their fear toward me is taught by the precept of men. They had the ceremonies. There's nothing wrong with the ceremonies that they were performing. There was not, there's nothing wrong with having morning worship, evening worship. There's nothing wrong with having worship before we open the office. There's nothing wrong with coming to church every Sabbath for service. There's nothing wrong with these ceremonies. But the prophet Isaiah here writes that something begins to happen with some Christians. We do these things over and over and over again. And what begins to happen? Now, they're a formality. I go to church. I go through the services of church. I go through the motions that are there. I kneel for the prayer. I stand for the hymn. I listen to the service. Then I stand for another song. I kneel for a prayer. I go through the motions of religion. So this ceremony, which is actually designed to lift us up and bring us closer to God, after some time in this church, it began to be formulaic. The services were just something that you did because you were supposed to do them. Well, I go to church because my daddy went to church, and his daddy went to church, and so we just continue to go through this form of services that are there. And what does the Lord tell us? The Lord says, even now they come, they honor me with their lips, but their heart, it's been far removed from me. Actually, our services become an abomination. You remember the parable which Christ gave? of two men. They both went to church on the same day to pray. They went to the synagogue to pray at the same time. We find the parable in the book of Luke. They were both there for a good reason. They were both there to perform the weekly duty of coming to the synagogue. But one of them, when he prayed, he got up there, he said, Oh Lord, thank you so much that I'm such a good man. I came to church, I was on time, I was not late for Sabbath school, I was there, I sang loud during the song, I was quiet during the prayer, I stayed all for the service, after the service I sang loud again in the song, I kneeled, I brought something to the fellowship meal, then I went home, and that was the end. The other man, he comes to church as well, he comes to synagogue, but he comes there with a purpose. What's his purpose? He says, Lord, be merciful to me, a sinner. It's there. Both of them came for the same ceremony that was there. But there was a problem. That Pharisee, the first person in the parable of Christ, in Desire of Ages, page 603, it says that the Pharisees were strictly adhering to the traditions. They were exact in their outward ceremonies diligent in washing and fasting, long prayers, giving their alms. But Christ declared that they made void the law of God by teaching for doctrines the commandments of men. As a class, they were bigoted and hypocritical. Yet among them were persons of genuine piety 
who accepted Christ's teachings and became his disciples. What happened to their religion? It became very formulaic, it became a ceremony, and the ceremonies, these outward ceremonies became very important. Very important. For example, should you be late for church? Should you be late for church? No. no, of course you shouldn't be late for church. Right? I, I would hope that next week everybody will be right on time. No one's going to be late. Everybody will be in church sitting in their place. 9.30 Sabbath school will start. That's important. But that became more important than the reason for the service. So the reason for the service, the reason we come together, is to spend time studying about Christ. They began to come... They didn't care about what the, who cares what the topic of the service is today. So long as everybody's on time. I'm going to stand at the door and I'm going to see who's late. And oh boy, am I going to give them a piece of my mind. It's true. After service today, I took note of everybody who's late and we're going to have a special talk later. Right? What was more important? It was more important that they understood why they were coming to church. But the ceremony became so important that it overtook the purpose for the service itself. And as a result, their ceremonies became burdensome. In Spirit of Prophecy, Volume 2, page 195, it says that their exactions and restrictions were so wearisome that Jesus declared they bind heavy burdens and grievous to be borne. They had a false standard which they'd set up. So as long as you came to church on time, you were saved. That was the most important thing. As long as you're never late for church, you're going to be saved. But they forgot that there was a work of the heart. That's why Isaiah wrote that there had to be that special work in the heart. That was the purpose for the ceremonies that they had. There is a balance to be brought out. Some people, they go to the other extreme. They're always late for church. I'm just using that as one example. They're always late for church. Every Sabbath they're late for church. And when you go and tell them about it and you say, you know, brother, sister, you know, you're, you're always late for church. Oh, then they get mad. Oh, you're so formalistic. You're so trying to keep all these rules. But there's a balance in Scripture. In Matthew chapter 23 and verse 23, that's an easy verse to remember. In Matthew chapter 23 and verse 23, we find there the balance that's brought out. It says, Woe unto you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites! For ye pay tithe of mint and anise and cumin, and have omitted the weightier things of the law, judgment, mercy, and faith. These ought ye to have done, and not to leave the other undone. Some people, they say, Oh, well, as long as I have the judgment, the mercy, the faith, then that's, that's sufficient. But what did Christ say? That's not enough. He says, you were supposed to do these things and not leave the other things undone. So we're not to go from one extreme to the other extreme. And we're all say, oh, it's okay. I don't have to keep any rules anymore. There's no commandments from God. I could just do whatever I want. That's running to the other. Christ said, you have to be balanced. You have to have faith to do all these things, but you have to do them too. So they had all these forms of godliness. But what happened to the substance of that godliness? In 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 5, Apostle Paul is writing to the young minister and he gives him some instruction. In 2 Timothy chapter 3, and verse 5, it says that there are some, they have a form of godliness, but they deny the power thereof. From such individuals, what should we do? Turn away from them. They actually become a drain on the church. They become so negative. Whenever you see people like that, they're always sad. They're always discouraged, always disappointed. They're so worried about taking care of all these little points. But they forget about Christ, who will actually make it possible for them to do all of those things. So that was the first problem of this church. That was the first thing that made them undesirable or unephesian because they were so rigid in their outward ceremonies they forgot the ceremonies themselves. What's the solution? Should we throw away the ceremonies? Should we then say, alright, you don't have to do anything anymore. 
Was that the solution to the problem? No. They were supposed to do all of those things, but to remember why it was that they did those things. Why did they assemble together? Why were these ceremonies important for them? Then we come to the next point that was mentioned in that sentence that we read from Testimonies Volume 8. The second reason that they became undesirable or unephesian is because they became more particular about the theory of the faith. When you teach, or when you're a student, and you go to university, what's the first thing that you do in every class? Every college class that you take, you have to start out with theory. I remember when I was teaching, oh, I, as, a, as a young teacher, I didn't have a choice which classes I was going to teach. So they assigned the class to me and I had to teach the introductory class. Nobody wants to teach the introductory class. It's just theory. Just theory. Theory is important because you can't do the practice later on without the theory for what's there. But the theory, it says, became more important than the actual faith itself. In Acts of the Apostles, page 580, going on to 581, it says that they began in this church, at this early time, to discuss unimportant points of doctrine. And the contemplation of pleasing fables of men's inventions occupied time that should have been spent in proclaiming the gospel. Is there such a thing as an unimportant point of doctrine? Wow, that seems a little bit, a little bit odd, doesn't it? An unimportant point of doctrine? And yet inspiration tells us that there were some points of doctrine which were not important for their salvation. But they began to dwell on these things. These things began to be very, very important. We have a historical example a really extreme historical example of how this happened. The Muslims were attacking Constantinople in the Middle Ages. They were about to overtake the great center of the Orthodox religion. The city was burning. It had been surrounded. The fleet had been destroyed. The Muslim fleet was at the port bombing the city. They were getting bombed from outside. The walls were falling apart. Every, this is a really bad condition for the city to be in. And just at this moment, the leaders of the church, they were meeting in the chapel in Santa Sofia, which was the great cathedral of the time. And they were meeting there, as the city's burning around them, to discuss two very important points. They had to make a decision about two very, very important points while the city's burning. So you can imagine how important these points were. The first point was, what was the color of Mary's <laughs> eyes? Were Mary's eyes blue? They spent days on this. Days and days and days. Discussing what color were Mary's eyes. Important? Very important? I don't know if that's really going to save you if you believe that they're blue or that they're green or that they're red. Does it actually have anything to do with the growth of your character? Does it have anything to do with your connection with Christ? And yet here, while the city's burning, they're spending days discussing this point. The second point, though, is my favorite. It's one of my all-time favorite doctrinal questions. They were debating whether or not a fly flying around in the church, if it lands in the holy water, is the water polluted or did the fly become holy? Okay. This became a very important point of doctrine while the city was burning around them. In reality, there's no such thing as holy water. But they were really discussing these points. And to such a degree that the Muslims actually managed to get into the city and take over the city and kill most of those bishops who were sitting there, sitting around debating these unimportant points of doctrine. It's there. There are such things as unimportant points of doctrine. And sometimes we get sidetracked into them. There are things that don't have anything to do with our personal salvation. There are things that will not help us grow one way or the other way. But in addition to this, not only did they become particular about the theory of the faith, but they also began to introduce unimportant points of doctrine and things that they themselves have made, had made up. Things that were not based on scripture at all, but things that sounded really good. I have some points like that too. Each of us, we have to take lessons from this. 
We shouldn't say, oh, this is something they did a long, long time ago. This is something we do today. I'm sure that every person in here at one point or another has invented a point of doctrine. You might not think so, but there's come a time when you've invented a new point of doctrine. Because you want to do something and you know that it's probably wrong. But if you can find some justification for it, then it would be okay to do it. So you go through and you, you think of it and say, ah, I think I have a new point of doctrine. Right? And then it excuses the thing that you wanted to do even though you know that it was probably wrong in the first place. Sometimes we invent things for convenience. I often tell people that I have a personal point of view about eggplant. I despise eggplant. I believe eggplant is one of the most disgusting things that a person can eat. It's my personal opinion. I can't, I can't, it's, I just can't describe in words to you what I think about eggplant. It's just a really terrible substance. And I read in inspiration that all these terrible things were supposed to be destroyed in the flood. Mm -hmm. You know, with the dinosaurs and all the bad plants and whatever, they were all supposed And the, I begin to think and I say, wow, you know, I think that eggplant was supposed to be destroyed in the flood. But Noah, you know, human frailty and weakness, he probably took a plant on the ark with him, and so the eggplant survived, and we suffer until this day <laughs> with our mothers trying to make us eat eggplant. It's there. And I begin to think about, and I dwell on this over and over again. And for me, this becomes very important. And I tell other people about this. Now I tell, you know, I say to Brother Cochran, I say, Brother Cochran, I hope you're not eating eggplant because it's an evil vegetable. Brother Cochran says, David, are you making stuff up again? I say, no, I'm sure of it. And I, because Brother Cochran doesn't agree with me, I begin to look very, very harshly on Brother Cochran. Yeah. And we begin to have doctrinal debates. We spend hours and hours discussing the point about eggplant. I go to his house, he comes to my house. During Sabbath school, I bring it up, even though it's not related to the point that the teacher asked the question, I still bring it up in Sabbath school. This becomes overreaching for me. Everything that I do in my life becomes about this eggplant point. In fact, I go home because I'm so sure that I'm right and I begin to research and I begin to write papers on the topic and I publish them. Of course, it's easier today. I got the internet. I can publish them all over the world. I'm sure that if I publish my eggplant doctrine, that I'll find some followers, somebody who will agree with me and we'll go ahead and we'll form a movement of people who are opposed to eggplant. And now this becomes very important for me. I come to church, we have special meetings about it, I go and visit you. What happened is that now all of my time becomes absorbed with this. What happened with this church is that they began to introduce these fanciful ideas that they had on their own. And they began to spend all their time doing that. What did they stop doing? See, I have to work because I have to, I have to eat. So I work as much as I can. In my free time, what am I supposed to be doing? I'm supposed to be spreading the gospel. That's what I'm supposed to be doing in my free time. But instead, I don't have time for that because I have to go home to prove that Brother Cochran should not eat eggplant. So I rush home from work and I spend all my time poring over books and trying to find symbolic versions of eggplant in the scripture. And I go way off. I have no time anymore to do the gospel work. You know, when, they're, when we're sent abroad somewhere to take care of a problem that's been happening in a church somewhere, you know what inspiration tells us? What's the best way to solve a problem in a church that's having trouble? Tell the people to go and do missionary work. If all of us are out spreading the gospel, we don't have time for any of this stuff. But what happened was they were spreading the gospel, but then there came a point where they didn't have time to do that anymore. And so now they had all the time to begin to study all these points. Most of them were not important. Some of them may have even been true, but they were not important to the individual's salvation. And they began to be distracted. They began to be unbalanced in what they had in their lives. This lack of balance in their lives. Some people do this today. We're health reformers. Everybody in this church is a health reformer. We all make sure to follow what's written in Scripture. 
that the that we have to take care of our bodies and all of us we believe that the message of health reform is the right arm of the third angel's message that we're going to go and preach not only the healing of the spirit and the mind mind but also of the body that's there that people should be healthy so for some people that right arm becomes the whole body there's a problem though because in your arm there's no heart there's no brain if your right arm's guiding all, the, all of your body, what's going to happen? You're going to become unbalanced. Eventually you'll die. Your arm can't pump any blood. Your arm can't think. That's there. Some people, they go too far. And that's what happened in this church. They became so particular about the theory of the faith. In Desire of Ages, page 126, it says, Genuine faith has its foundation in the promises of and provisions of the scriptures that were there. If it was genuine faith, if it was something for them, where would it be? It would be in, it would be in scripture. If they wanted to study, they should study. Each of us should study. We should spend time in scripture, but they became unbalanced for what was there. In Council on Sabbath School Work on page 106, it says genuine faith, real faith, confides in Christ and renders implicit submission, consenting to follow Him wheresoever He goeth. Genuine faith is saying, Christ, today lead me on my way. That's real faith. To believe that Christ is going to guide you in every point throughout this day, that is real faith that's there. Then there's the last point. The last point that was mentioned in that sentence from Testimonies, Volume 8, was that they became more severe in their criticism. And remember, these things, they build one on top of another. When the ceremonies became more important than the theory, than the, sorry, than the actual basis for the ceremonies, then they began thinking about the theories of why we have these ceremonies. Then they started coming up with new doctrines. And as they started coming up with these new doctrines, it started to bring disagreement. Remember, the seventh point that made them desirable was their unity. But now, Brother Cocker and I, we have differences on the eggplant point. And Sister Pearl, she's got another point all on her own. She's, she's got a point about asparagus. So I, but asparagus is fine for me. I, I like asparagus. So, so now we begin to differ on the asparagus point. There, but she agrees with Brother Cocker on that point. Right? But then again, we have Sister Lisa, and Lisa has her thing about soy, you know, when you can eat soy and when you can't. So she's got a difference with Sister Pearl, but she agrees with Brother Cocker and me. Right? So what's going to happen in this church now? Well, I like Sister Lisa. She agrees with me. But Sister Pearl and Brother Cocker, uh, they're a problem. We've got to do something about this. And I, I begin to find ways to, to say things about them, and they're obviously... She doesn't like asparagus. She can't be a Christian. Right? That's there. And the unity of the church began to break apart. They were really looking at each other. If I can find out that Sister Pearl is doing something wrong, then I can tell everybody about it. And if I tell everybody, then nobody will like Sister Pearl and she'll be out. Mm -hmm. Then everybody in the church will be asparagus eating. Mm -hmm. But the Cochran's doing the same thing, though. He's following me around after work. He follows me around Kroger to see what I'm going to buy. <laughs> in, order to, in order to try and find out, well, let me see. If I can catch David buying ice cream, I can tell everybody. Then he's a bad person. Because everybody will know that David eats ice cream. So there, he's following me around in Kroger. And we begin to criticize each other on everything. Every little point that's there. Christ, he knew that such time would come. He knew that there comes a point when this becomes a temptation to people. And so he told in the Sermon on the Mount, in Matthew chapter 7, we have written there his instruction about what we should do if we ever have this temptation. If I'm ever tempted to, to say about somebody else, you know, he's like this, he's like this. If I'm ever tempted to judge somebody else that's there. Christ gave us some very specific instruction. In Matthew chapter 7, this is from the Sermon on the Mount, starting at verse 4. 
It says, How wilt thou say to thy brother, Let me pull out the mote out of thine eye, and behold, a beam is in thine own eye? Thou hypocrite, verse 5, first cast out the beam out of thine own eye, and then shalt thou see clearly to cast out the mote out of thy brother's eye. There was a danger in that church. As they became critical of one another, there was a danger that they forgot to look at, their se at themselves. But it was there. You see, because I'm, I'm a good person. I, I really am a good person. In fact, I'm a much better person, much better than Brother Maurice. Oh, look, look at me. And look at him, of course, of course you're going to say that I'm better than he is. Right? And I begin to be, I'm so happy because I'm better than Brother Maurice. And I begin to walk around church and sometimes I notice people that don't realize that I'm so good. So I have to remind them of this fact. I have to tell them about how good I am and I have to stress this fact to them somehow because, I don't know, Natalie is just not realizing how good of a person I really am and how privileged she is to be in the same room as me. So I begin to go from plan I, and I begin to do things to show just how really good I am that's there and contrast myself to other people because they're not so good like I am. But I forget a couple of things. I forget something that the Apostle Paul wrote also to the young minister in 1 Timothy, you can read it there. He, he wrote something, and all of us, we would agree that the Apostle Paul is a great, a great Christian, that he was a wonderful example to the, to the young man. In 1 Timothy chapter 1, verse 15, the Apostle Paul is describing himself. How does he describe himself? He says, this is a faithful saying and worthy of all ac acceptation that Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners of whom I am the chief. That's there. What did he say about himself? He said, I, the Apostle Paul, I am the chief of sinners. But in this church, they forgot this fact. They forgot that Christ came to save sinners. They were so happy about how good they were, about how strict they were in their outward observances, about how careful they were never to eat an eggplant. This became so important. Their own goodness became so important that Christ didn't need to save them anymore. If I'm so good, I don't need Christ to save me. I can save myself. In reality, I know that I can't do this. I cannot save myself. But I begin to think of myself this way. I begin to think of how much I can do to save myself. It's there. I don't need Christ anymore. Christ's not important in my life. I'm a really good person. But the Apostle Paul says that Christ came to save sinners. If we would take hold of Christ then, we have to realize this fact. If I'm busy, Worrying about myself as a sinner, how much time do I have to look at Brother Lopez? How much time? I don't have any time. I'm busy because I know that I have to reach a certain condition that we read in the beginning in Revelation 14, 12 to keep the commandments of God in the faith of Jesus. And as I consider myself as a chief of sinners, how will I do this? I don't have time anymore to look at Brother Jang. I, I don't have time. I'm much too busy because I have to spread the gospel and I have to worry about my salvation. If we'll do these things, if we'll avoid the pitfalls that are there, God will richly bless us. In 1 John chapter 4, from verse 7 to 11, the Apostle John wrote, Beloved, let us love one another, for love is of God. And everyone that loveth is born of God, and knoweth God. He that loveth not knoweth not God, for God is love. In this was manifest the love of God toward us, because that God sent His only begotten Son into the world, that we might live through Him. Herein is love. Not that we loved God, 
but that He loved us and sent His Son to be the propitiation for our sins. Beloved, if God so loved us, we ought also to love one another. When we look at each other, are we going to see sinners? We will. Because that's what we are. We're not going to critique each other for being sinners, but we'll realize, here's a fellow sinner. I need help. And so do they. How can I help them? How can I help them to reach the goal? Each of us can be desirable. We can be like Ephesus, the, the actual meaning of the word. We can have Christ living in us, the first desirable point. That's what it says in Colossians 1.27, to whom Christ would make known what is the riches of the glory of this mystery among the Gentiles, which is Christ in you, the hope of glory. We can have this. We can have all the wonderful promises that were there, and we can also have what's written in verse 7. In Revelation chapter 2, verse 7, we read that if we overcome, if we'll not have those three things, if we'll overcome those three things, and instead, if we will take hold of Christ and be desirable, we'll have right to eat of the tree of life. Do you know what the tree of life is? The tree of life is the source of life. Who's the source of life in our lives? In Review and Herald, there's a wonderful statement written. It says, Christ is the source of our life, the source of immortality. He is the tree of life. What's the promise to us? If we'll overcome, if we'll not take hold of these three things, if we'll not care about the outward ceremony, but care about the reason why we come to church, why we have worship every day on our own. If we'll not get sidetracked to unimportant points of doctrine, but spread the gospel as we're supposed to. And if we'll not criticize each other, but if we'll help each other, then we're told that we'll have this promise. We'll have the promise to be able to partake of the tree of life. We'll be able to partake of Christ. He'll be with each one of us here today. And that's my wish and prayer that we might be able to go through this week helping one another to be able to be true overcomers and to be desirable in the eyes of God. Amen. Amen. Our Father which art in heaven, we thank you, Lord, for this wonderful day which you've given us. We thank you, Lord, for setting aside a time for us to rest, to be able to fellowship together, and to be able to worship you. We thank you, Lord, that you give us peace and liberty, that you've given us your word and freedom that we can study. And we ask, Lord, that as we go through the rest of this Sabbath day, that you will help us to guide our thoughts, our actions, so that everything that we do will be to your honor and to your glory. We realize, Lord, that there are times in our lives when we've come short of this honor and glory. We know that there are times when we've become critical of each other, times when we've taken time from doing the work which you've set for us to do other things which were not important. And we know that there were times when we've come and we've participated in the wonderful services which you've provided, but that we have not done this from genuinely from our hearts. We ask, Lord, that you would forgive us for these times and help us, give us the power, the strength which you've promised to us through Christ to be able in the future to be desirable to you. Help us to be able to surrender completely to your will that we might be able to truly have Christ living within us as the hope of all of our glory. We ask, Lord, that you would be with those who are traveling away from us this day, be especially with Brother Silva and the group of believers in Guyana, with the other brethren who are traveling away from us this day. And also, Lord, we would ask that you would be with those who are still in places where they're being persecuted for their faith, those who are not having the freedom to be able to study your word, to be able to fellowship together as we do here. We ask that you would give them a special portion of this Sabbath day's blessing. We ask these things, Lord, not because we are worthy, but in the precious name of Christ, our Lord and Savior. Amen. Amen. Amen.